we can talk about it in a matter of fact way. And that's how we're going to get through to it. And that's how we're going to do this. And, you know, for any parents out there, the anti porn speech is not the birds and the bees speech. It's similar to the don't smoke speech. It's similar to the don't drink speech. And you know what, we need to make this happenstance. We need to make this matter of fact. And I think that you, the three of us just showed, we don't have to get graphic. We don't have to get dirty. We can talk about this like adults. We can joke and laugh. And that's where we need to move as a society when it comes to pornography. Uh, Joshua Shea, well, uh, thanks for joining us on Knocking Doors Down. Of course, people can go to recoveringpornaddict.com, find out more about the great work you're doing. Your, your three books, uh, Porn and the Pandemic, uh, He's a Porn Addict, Now What? And uh, The Addiction Nobody Will Talk About. And that's what we're talking about. So we, we appreciate your time. And for those that are just listening, you got to watch the YouTube just to see how badass sh uh, Joshua's shirt is. Okay, rocking the killer it. Western shirt today. Well, you know, it's it's so cold here in Maine that uh, I think maybe if I dress like a cowboy, I'll feel warmer inside. And, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that that's, I, I told you in the pre-show that, you know, my wife and my mother sadly dressed me for the first 44 years of my life. And around six months ago, I said, screw it. I'm going on to uh, Amazon and I'm buying the clothes that I want. <laughs> and I stumbled upon this one great shop that sells uh, Western shirts. And now I have like seven or eight of them. And my wife absolutely hates them. Won't let me go out to dinner wearing them or anything like that. So I, 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 I tend to, you know, wear them when she's not home and when I can get away with it. <laughs> oh, shit. We're definitely a little spoiled here. I'm cold and it's what, 60 degrees? Yeah. But we're in California. Yeah. So oh, you poor babies, <laughs> poor, poor babies. It, I think with the wind chill today, it's probably about negative 10 here. Oh, hell um, no. I yeah, used to spend, yeah. spend winters with my grandma in Alaska. So I know what you're talking about. That is uh, some unbearable shit, at least for me. I can't do it again. No way. Uh -uh. Well, it's like I have to tell myself I choose to live here, you know, it's, I was born here, my family's here, my wife, my kids, and none of them are leaving. So I, I would rather live in Southern California, but I would have to live by myself. And uh, I think that would just look like the ultimate heel move to say, okay, <laughs> bye, I'm going to where it's warm. So yeah. I, while, I, while nobody is technically keeping me here, I, uh, I just don't feel like I can leave even though I would love to. <laughs> well, that's the thing, you know, my family, they're always talking about moving out of California because they're like, oh, the taxes are outrageous and this and that. And I'm just like, yeah, but it's California. We're two hours from <laughs> right. the snow. We're two hours from the beach. It's 70 degrees in December. Like, there's a reason why it's expensive to be here because it's badass. <laughs> well, exactly. And I've spent, my brother uh, has lived in LA for 20 years mm -hmm. and he's actually moving back. Really? Uh, because he can do it. Yeah, he worked works for the uh, uh, making... Um, documentaries for the Discovery Networks. Mm -hmm. And he's been doing that for a long time. But, you know, as it turns out, almost everything he does is on the road anyway, um, when it goes to comes to making shows, doing interviews and whatnot. And when it comes to writing scripts and doing budgeting and that stuff, because he's uh, an executive producer, it's easy enough to do it from any computer anywhere. Right. So he's decided to move uh, him and his wife and his two kids back here to Maine, which is, I don't understand it at all, but <laughs> Hey, you know, it's, it's, it's his life, whatever. I was yeah. hoping we could just house swap. But, uh, <laughs> he, his, his, his real estate was a little bit uh, more high end than mine. Oh, and yeah. A little bit oh, more, yeah. a little bit more expensive than mine. <laughs> LA's no joke, man. LA's no joke. Well, yeah. uh, of course, Josh, you know, um, the reason you're doing the work you are in as far as bringing light to pornography as an addiction is because obviously you suffered it from, uh, from it yourself, as well as alcoholism. Um, what do you, you know, how, how are you doing work now with this? How are you being able to maintain it? Obviously with the pandemic, you know, pre-recording, we're talking, you're pretty much an introvert and stay home anyways, but you're trying to reach out to, to those that are in need of this, uh, primarily men, but, but women as well. Yeah. What I'm, what I'm doing, um, you know, it, it was odd that I just, I don't know what it's like to be called to God. I'm not a super spiritual person, but something hit me, you know, 
four or five years ago that just said, I have to tell this story. I, by trade, am a journalist. I worked in newspapers and magazines for over 20 years. I love telling people stories. I love communicating. And I just, something hit me that said, we need to talk about this. When I went to the bookstore to try to find uh, any literature about porn addiction, because I'm a research geek, I couldn't find anything. And while I can sit, you know, in my bed very comfortably and read the New England Journal of Medicine, I know most people can't. But I'm, you know, when somebody says I read a study, well, I'm actually the geek that does read the studies. (laughs) And I said that, you know, I think I need to tell my story. Um, I have a lot of information, but I also have the experience. So I told my story in that first book. And what was fascinating was I expected to hear from some addicts, and I did. But what came in, probably 75% of the messages I got were from the partners of addicts, wives and girlfriends, um, for, for the most part, wanting to know, you know, am I? I dealing with a porn addict in my life and what do I do? And as I started to talk to more and more of these women, um, I started to learn the phrase betrayal trauma. And Mm. I, I teamed up with a friend of mine who is a licensed marriage and family therapist um, out in California. And we wrote that second book. He's a porn addict. Now what, which is a very simple Q and a, for women who find who find themselves in that situation or believe that you know their their husband or boyfriend hasn't come out as an addict yet but they believe he's there so we wrote that book and i have absolutely been fascinated with the betrayal trauma side of things um, and I'm now a licensed uh, or a certified betrayal trauma coach. And I work with a lot of these women because not only do I have all this knowledge, but I have the experience. So I'm almost sometimes used as a translator of what their addict boyfriend or addict husband are saying and what they're really saying. And what I've also found is that the best way to get to an addict to help them is to go through the wife or the girlfriend because you talk to them, you get them comfortable and then you can get to the guy and he's then more comfortable. And when he starts talking to you and realizes you're not going to judge him because you've seen just as much, you know, crazy stuff as he has, and you're not going to make him feel bad and you're not going to shame him. That's, that's the way to get there is through the, through the uh, partner and uh, just discovered that by happenstance, but I both go on, you know, shows like this, write these books to try to reach the mainstream audience and let them know we have a major problem with pornography use in this country, or I should say unhealthy pornography use in this country. And then I try on a one-on-one basis to help, you know, the, the addicts themselves and their partners. And that keeps me pretty busy And that, you know, like I said, I don't know what it feels like to be called to God or anything, but I feel like maybe being a, a newspaper reporter and magazine publisher, and I was a local politician for a while, and all of this stuff that I thought I was you know, born and bred to do, I think I just had to go through it to get to here, because here is where it feels like I'm actually supposed to be. Yeah, well, and so many of our guests have said that, that, that you know, they, they wouldn't trade what they've been through to get to where they're at now. Yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was hard. And those first two years of recovery were challenging, especially as I was going through and dealing with the unresolved trauma, um, because that is not a fun process. And as I was going through the cognitive behavioral therapy and changing my day to day behaviors, that was really rough, too. But once I got through that early recovery, it was just, you know, it was amazing how much better life was. And I realized I lost all of my 20s. I lost almost all of my 30s. And now, you know, my, my son just turned 18 years old the other day. And I think about how I lost those years when he was seven, eight, nine years old. And thankfully, our last, you know, five, six years have been great. And I finally got to be the father that I wanted to be. But in looking back, I just lost so many years to both the uh, porn and the alcohol. And I knew I wasn't connecting with with him or my daughter or my wife. And thankfully, I got them back in the last few years. And if if people would understand just how 
important those connections are, just how wonderful and fulfilling those connections are. I think we may be able to get a few more people away from addiction because, you know, I, I am now healthy, happier, um, physically, spiritually, emotionally better than I have been probably going back to any other point in my life. Because like you, I I found this stuff at a very young age. I became, yeah. you know, an alcoholic at a very young age. Um, I feel younger now than I did at 17. <laughs> well, let's talk about that. The, what, at what point, let's jump back to uh, Josh as, as a kid. Uh, you know, what was it like growing up? Uh, you mentioned, you know, you had a brother. Was there other siblings? What was the relationship like with your folks? And really, how did the, uh, the first traumas really, really start for you? Yeah, um, my, my folks were great. They grew up in some really crappy environments. Three out of their four parents were alcoholics. Um, a little bit of mental health issues there. On my dad's side, I think his parents are both dead now, but I think for the two of them combined, I think they had about eight <clears throat> marriages between them. Oh um, on my mom's side, she had parents who were very, very distant. And I think in a very odd way, when my parents got together in the late 70s and started having kids, my brother and I, I think that what they tried to create in our house was the idyllic 1950s house they saw on TV, but that neither of them were growing up in. Right. I look back and it's like my my life and my growing up years were very much a 1950s leave it to beaver Aussie and Harriet Dennis the menace <laughs> you know sort of household and I I think that that is not necessarily the best household to live in because they were very conservative. Um, sex was completely off the table. You know, I could watch Rambo on HBO, but if something came on and there was the slightest hint of breast or, or butt, it was, it was off. Yeah. And yeah. as my parents, you know, were raising me this way, um, they were school teachers, elementary school teachers. Huh. They sent me to this babysitter every day um, when they were working and it was like night and day because there was so much sexual inappropriateness at this babysitter's house there was yeah. sexual abuse happening there there was a lot of mental and emotional abuse um, and i can look back now all these years later having gone through recovery having having learned so much about mental health and i can see that this woman was so sick and should not be taking care of kids she had ocds that were, you know, insane. She would comb my hair 20, 30 times a day. She would vacuum her house and she had no floors. She only had carpeting. She would vacuum it five, six times a day. And I'd have to follow along picking up every piece of lint. She called me George because she liked that name better than Josh. And that wasn't like once in a while calling me George. It was every time calling me what George. The fuck? So Jeez. yeah, exa exactly. And I look back now and go, wow, that is really messed up. But in the moment, you don't know because you're a three or four year old kid. And yeah. there was all of this abuse happening there. Um, and if you look at Patrick Carnes, who's kind of the godfather of the whole sex and porn addiction studying, and he was doing this, you know, years before anybody else, he had a groundbreaking study where, and I'm going to be off by a couple percentage points here, but essentially uh, rounding them off, he found that of sex and porn addicts, 70% of men had some kind of physical trauma in their background that was unresolved about 80 percent had sexual trauma in their background that was unresolved and over 90 percent had some kind of emotional um or mental trauma in their past and from this woman's house i had both the sexual and the emotional um issues happening there and it was strange because i really got a, a sense of two worlds i felt very safe with my parents yeah. But sexuality was completely off of the table. At this babysitter's house, I felt completely unsafe, but it was an open sexual environment. Um, and like I said, there was, you know, flat out abuse happening there, but there was something intriguing about it to me. So it was very much these two very different worlds. Now, I, I got out of there probably about seven or eight years old. Um, when I was 12 years old, my older cousin showed me a couple of um, hardcore pornography magazines for the first time. 
And I will tell you within, I don't remember what the titles were. I don't even remember what was on the page, but I remember within 10 seconds, knowing that I had found something special. I had found mm -hmm. something that was going to be the way for me to live my life. This was just the answer. You know, this was the answer. And um, for people who say, you know, I don't think porn addiction is real. I'll tell you, the only other time I've ever felt this way was about two years later when I was 14 years old at a wedding. And I went around and snuck champagne off the tables that nobody was sitting at. And I got drunk for the first time. And that was one of these, oh my goodness, I feel so much better moments mm -hmm. of, you know, I, I look better, I'm smarter, I'm funnier, <laughs> I dance better, everything is better with this stuff. This stuff reminds me of the magazines that I'm looking at. Right. And shortly thereafter, you know, at 14, 15 years old, I would ride my bike home from school, you know, get something to eat and then ride my bike to first the video store because we still had those. Mm -hmm. But that was at a point when some of the big ones like Blockbuster were just starting. So the mom and pops would rent anything to you. And one day I got the I got the guts up to go into the back room behind the saloon swinging doors. And uh, I grabbed the first two movies I saw and walked out and went to the counter and the guy didn't even bat an eye. I rented two pornos and I was feeling so empowered. I went to the convenience store where I heard that you could buy cigarettes and beer if you were a kid. And I went and I picked up a couple bottles of beer and set them on the counter. They didn't bat an eye. They sold them to me. And from that point forward, um, almost every day after school, if I didn't have some kind of activity, I would ride my bike and later drive my car, pick up a, two porno movies and then go to the convenience store and buy a couple bottles of beer. And I never had the guts to buy a full six pack. I always just pulled a couple bottles out. I don't know what, what I was thinking there. And then I'd put them in my backpack and ride my bike back home. Before my parents came home from work, I'd watch one porno movie, drink a couple beers. And then six hours later, when everybody went to bed, I had a VCR in my room. I would watch the other porno movie and I'd drink the other two beers, which were warm at that point because I had to hide them under my bed. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that was my life for, for a very long time. And you know, I can look at my timeline of life and recognize those times when I was at my worst or when things were down. Right. That's absolutely when the porn and the uh, the drinking popped up. And uh, you know, it's I, I I wish I had some kind of crazy unique story, but I am as far as a co occur co occurring disorder guy. Um, I've also got bipolar disorder. I was diagnosed in my early twenties. Huh. Um, uh, there, there, there's a lot of textbook to me, but sure. I'm one of the few willing to talk about this because when I went to look for resources, they just weren't there, and that's why I decided to start creating them and start uh, trying to reach out to people because um, one of the most damning statistics I've seen, and keep in mind, this is pre-pandemic, sure. one of the most damning statistics I saw was from an organization called the Barna Group, and they interviewed thousands of men back in 2017, and they found men under 30 years old, 18 to 30 year old age group, 30, 32 to 33% said they either looked at too much pornography, they thought they were developing a pornography addiction, or they already had a pornography addiction. And that's one out of three men under 30. And it's not like they just start watching at 18. We know they're watching yeah. down to 12, 13 years old regularly now. And so it just seems to me that, you know, if we don't start talking about this, if we're not open about this, if we don't recognize that, you know, we we now give every 12 year old kid the greatest porn computer in the world sure. with their yeah. iPhone or their Android, and we don't give them any uh, advice on how to use it or any advice on how to consume pornography or the potential problems with it, uh, that this is just going to keep going. And those guys who are 30 are soon going to be 40, are soon going to be 50. We're now seeing a flood of women uh, reporting pornography addiction because now that they can get it very easily and sure. now that, you know, it's not about somebody seeing you going into an adult theater or someone seeing you going into an adult bookstore, that 
you know, it turns out everybody's sexual and everybody's curious. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing yeah. this across all demographics now where for the most part, it was straight white men for decades. Now everybody and every demographic is starting to report big numbers in this area. So we, we need to get this information out there. And, you know, I, I push, I am not anti-pornography. That's crazy. That's even, that's even crazier than being you know, uh, against uh, pro or being for prohibition, we saw how poorly that worked. Yeah, that years shit ago. didn't work too well, did it? And no, and the thing is, the thing is, go into any fine art museum, uh, go into any uh, place where you can see historic relics. You go to the Egyptian exhibit and some of the ancient medieval stuff. You look at that pottery, and you are going to see some triple X stuff painted on yeah. it. Or you go into that, you know, that area between the Tigris and Euphrates River where civilization started. And from the beginning of, of mankind being able to draw in charcoal on a cave wall, we have been depicting pornography. So sure. it's not going to go anywhere. All of the arguments against banning it are a waste of time. What we need to do is instead of being anti-pornography, we need to be pro-healthy sexuality and we need to just start educating people on pornography use, on the potential problems with it, like we do with alcohol, with cigarettes, with drugs, with everything else. Um, that's, you know, that, that's the world that I want to see. I'm not trying to ban porn from anybody because that's a fool's errand. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny, you know, you're telling that story. I'm thinking about when uh, I was in Italy with my grandparents, my mom and aunt, my, my grandma had to see David, the statue of David, very yep. famous nude statue. And we get there, we, we, we segue off just for this. She looks up at it and I don't mean him, it, and she just goes, huh, ah, it's not that impressive and walks out. I'm like, oh, my grandma came all this way because she was yeah. an intellectual person, but just because of that, you know, that kind of thing is probably something, who knows, in her childhood studied that art because she was really into art. Um, well, a a absolutely, and it's one of those things where you go into these fine art museums and you see these nudes and you think to yourself, well, this isn't dirty, this is art, this is right. beautiful. Yeah. That's like, well, but think about when they were painted, think about when they were sculpted. They had no cameras, they had no video cameras, they didn't, you know, th there was no yeah. other form of nudity. That's what they had. So I, I'm curious, or I would be curious if, if you know, I, I doubt there's any way to ever know, but if you could go back to those times, what were people like? Because people are not that different. People, you know, we still make babies the same way and we're still all fascinated by, you know, the human body. I, I'd be curious what their mindsets really were towards the, the art that depicted nudity back then. Well, I mean, you had even such things as the Kama Sutra that has been around forever as well. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. it's kind of absolutely, absolutely kind of passing along. Hey, these are things that could bring you and your partner joy or, you know, mutual pleasure. But um, let's let's talk with, uh, you know, so alcoholism is running, the pornography is running, but you accomplished all these things, you know, you're working in. in uh, you know, as a published writer, uh, you know, a, a magazine, I I, I'm assuming, you, you know, you, as you said, you, you got married, had, had children. I mean, how did you, I know for me with the alcoholism, that, that functioning ability went away, but how were you just managing it? Because they're not I easy jobs. I compartmentalized. No, I okay. compartmentalized. And as long as I didn't have to be the Joshua Shea, who I really was, I was fine. Um, and, and my wife even reminds me 10 years ago when I was elected to the city council, I would literally say to her, okay, I'm going to go play city councilor now. And I remember once I got into recovery, I went back and looked at some of the meetings on tape and I had no idea what I was talking about, but I was able to get into that mindset in the moment. Ironically, I went to many of those meetings drunk. There was one where the mayor wasn't there and they voted me to play mayor that that one or that meeting. And I was actually, I was three sheets to the wind and I don't remember any of it, uh, which is you know utterly embarrassing now, but yeah. that's, that's the way I was. I had the guy who ran the magazine that I started. I had the guy who ran the film festival I started and, and politics guy and, uh, husband and father and son 
And, you know, I, I was able to compartmentalize everything. What, what was the problem was when I would get home at night, when all of the networking events or, uh, you know, special dinners were done, when the kids and the wife went to bed and it was just me left sitting there on the couch, sitting by myself being Joshua Shea was the toughest part for me. That was the part I didn't like. That's when I would go and pour myself a glass of tequila this tall. That's when I would grab the laptop and start to look at pornography. Because, and I, I learned this in recovery, the alcohol, like it is for a lot of people, was about numbing and just sure. about you know chilling yourself out. My pornography addiction was about power and control. And it, you know, when I was a kid and I was having some of this horrible stuff happen to me at this babysitter's house, I think I made a subconscious promise to myself that I would never cede my power to anybody again. And I think that that had to do, and I think that the, uh, the sexual part of it kind of was imprinted because that was so much of where the trauma came from. So I've always run my own businesses. I've always done my own thing. I've never let people run my life for me. I've never been, I, or I should say I, I am now, but I was one of those people who didn't ask permission. I just said sorry afterwards. And I was right. charming enough that I could get uh, away with it most of the time. Um, it, it was one of these things. Where if you came into my office at my, at my magazine, uh, you would see plaques and trophies and certificates all over my wall. And that wasn't to convince you I was awesome. That was to convince me I was awesome. Um, because, you know, I, I had some of this imposter syndrome stuff. I didn't sure. believe I was in control of my life. I believed I was playing all these different parts. And that's how I was able to manage it. It was not until I was by myself and I was sitting there and, and couldn't be who I am. I had to drink the alcohol to numb. I had to get on the computer and look at pornography for the control aspects because the, the, the I don't want to say great thing about pornography, but one of the advantages of pornography for a control freak is that nobody on that page or nobody on that screen can say no to you. If yeah, I want, you know, if I, if I want an Asian girl and a Latino girl to be going at it, I boom, boom, boom. I found it. If I want to watch, you know, three guys, two girls, two dogs and hear Irish music while they all throw fish sticks at each other. I'm sure I can find that somewhere on online too. And, uh, and, and, and but you you're right. What? They can't, uh, they can't say no. Right. Yeah. They're not going to tell me to take the trash out. They're not going to tell me that I didn't do a good job at work today. They're not going to nag me. They're not going to say anything. And if they're not doing it for me, click, I'm on to something else. 5150 is power. The power to overcome. The power to persevere. The power to set your life on a course for success. When you're faced with the challenges life throws at you, you focus and do what is needed to go beyond what is required. So stand up, stand firm, believe, make it happen, and live through the madness knocking doors down along the way. We are 5150. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. porn is a fantasy world, and for people who have control issues like I did, it was, it was a perfect place to escape to. Yeah, and you, you just end up diving so deep into it, just like any other addiction, and, and, you know, and like you said, that I can relate to so much that sitting there, it's, in, it, you know, what, as you call it, compartmentalizing. Um, I know Charlie Sheen, he, he said in a way that I've always said it when we spoke with him was playing different roles for different people. Yeah, um, you know, absolutely. and even even the people pleasing element of it, of like you said, ah, I got to do city council guy, play mayor over here, play dad, play husband, you know, play, you know boss and so on um that it's it's so incredibly common because we've had at some point that control like you said taken away from us um but i want to know for you where was the point was there a, a, a deep rock bottom or was there just a moment where you had to look in the mirror and went josh this is i'm not living a life or wow i've really fucked up and i've got to turn things around Oh yeah, there was there was that moment. That moment was when the Maine State Police came to my door in okay. uh, March of 2014. 
Um, my 2013 was a very unhealthy year for me. I saw the revenue at my magazine starting to drop. And for five years, I started this magazine in 2008, shortly after the the uh, housing crisis. And everybody told me I was crazy, but we were literally an overnight success. I had a five-year business plan that was done within four months. And while that's cool, it's a problem. It's a good problem, but it's still a problem. Sure. And for somebody like me, I can write, I can take photos, I can design pages, I can edit, I can do all of that stuff all day long. I'm not a good business person, but when you throw barrels of money at me, I can hide that fact for many <laughs> years. And eventually things started to plateau and I didn't know how to handle it because our expenses were still going up as they always did, but we started to plateau and then we started to lose revenue. So I started kind of freaking out in early 2013 because I could see what was coming down the road. Mm -hmm. So I made the absolutely stupid, stupid decision to pull myself off of my bipolar medication. I, I romanticized the mania of my late teens, early 20s before I was diagnosed. Um, I felt like, you know, the medication was like a restrictor plate on a race car on me. If I got off the meds, then I could, uh, my creativity would help save the magazine. I'd have a few extra hours every night to save the magazine. And instead, what happened was once the meds were out of my system within two weeks, um, I was drinking three, four times a day, um, much more than ever before. I was using pornography more than just at night. I would bring the kids to school in the morning and go back home. And I sometimes got a little bit of work done at home before I went to the office, but I'd go home and look at porn for the first time in the mornings. And I did this for a couple months. And like with any other addiction, it has to escalate. And yeah. I made the decision, horrible decision, to start going into chat rooms. And these were one-on-one -on -one back and forth chat rooms. And where if you didn't like what you were seeing, you could hit the button and somebody else's cam would come up. And I learned very fast how to go around this system because people were not stopping. Even though I was you know, eight years younger than I am now, I looked probably 10 years older than I am now. I had another <laughs> 75 pounds on me. I, I was probably showering once a week at that point. I mean, it was not a healthy situation. So I couldn't get people to stop and talk to me. So I figured out how to, I found a video of a good looking 20 something year old guy who looked like he was just typing away. And I figured out how to go around my, my camera and show that video instead. And then I could start to get, you know, good looking women to stop and talk to me. And before long, I was, you know, my control issues, I was getting women to um, take off their clothes and do sexual things. And unfortunately, um, the police came to my door March 20th, 2014, and said one of these women happened to be a, an underage female. And oh I was like, oh my God. So they came in, they came in, you know, when a police officer has a search warrant, you invite them in. Yeah. And uh, we sat down and they put the stuff in front of me and said, boom. And it's like, I'm not going to fight you on this. You've got me, you've got me. But I'll tell you the moment they, the moment they came to my door, I didn't know what they were there for, but when they told me, I thought to myself, oh my God, my life is forever going to be different. And it only took me about 10, 15 minutes of talking to them before it was like, oh my God, thank God my life is going to be different wow. because I was just driving myself to an early grave. And it was interesting about an hour later, we had a, actually a very good conversation. It was almost like a therapy session um, when we were driving to the sheriff's office because they did have to arrest me, obviously. Um, he the, the guy told me he's like you are the calmest guy i have ever met in my life and i said i just think that you may have saved my life and this was where things were headed and thank god that you stepped in because i don't i don't know what was going to stop me and 
I, as cheesy and trite and, and lifetime movie as it sounds, Hallmark movie as it sounds, um, those, I, I, you know, first looked at those guys as devils at my door, but those police sure. officers saved my life. And I, you know, I, and I do want to stress that, you know, I don't blame the addiction. It did, it did screw with my understanding of cause and effect and consequences, but I knew I had this mental health issue. Mm -hmm. I pulled mm -hmm. myself off of my meds. That's my bad. That's my fault. Um, I shouldn't have done this to any woman. That's it's cheating. I cheated on my wife doing this and yeah. it sucks. And I, 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 I am shamed to this day and I can listen to Brene Brown all day. I'm never going to lose that shame because it's just a crappy thing to do. It was a crappy thing to do to all of the women. I did this to for about a four month period that I was doing it, whether they were 28 or 16 and it was, it, it, it's just, it was a bad thing. And I don't want people to ever think that I'm minimizing or I'm rationalizing anything that happened. I fully get it. I ended up in 2016 doing six months in jail for it very deservedly. Um, but it was in jail where I met guys who were of a much lower socioeconomic demographic than I am. Sure. But their stories uh, and most of them had issues with sex and pornography their issues were the exact same as the issues i heard at the inpatient rehab i went to right outside wow. dallas and i'm talking about you know i i was one of my roommates was an nba player who was uh who retired shortly before i went there because he couldn't stop masturbating in his truck and kept getting caught by people um you know this guy was a millionaire his, yeah. I heard almost his exact same story from a guy who spent almost half his life homeless. And that's when I, that, that again was one of those times where I was like, I've got to do something here. So I spent my last three of the, of the six months that I served in county jail, I spent the last three of them writing that first book or the, the first draft of that book. And, you know, I want people to recognize that number one, um, anybody can be a porn addict anybody there i've met men women from the age of 16 up till the uh late 70s it doesn't matter how much money you make your education your religion your ethnicity there is no stereotypical porn addict and number two what i try to tell people who are porn addicts are on the road there for 99.9% .9 of the time I was an addict, I could not get, I would not have got to that place where I could cheat on my wife by talking to a woman online, by trying to entice a woman to do sexual things online, but I got there. And if yeah. I can get there, anybody can anybody. get there. I'm sure there are people listening who think, oh my God, that guy really went off the deep end. We can all go off the deep end because addiction escalates, especially when you've got more than one addiction at a time, and especially when you have a mental health condition on top of it. Yeah, two interesting things off of that. I remember when uh, one of my grandfathers, we were clearing out his stuff um, after he passed, sure as shit, uh, in his pickup truck, there was, you know, uh, uh, an explicit triple X magazine. And then the other thing that you were talking about that I was doing some reading prior to being able to speak with you is that it was showing, especially with men, when it comes to pornography, is the type of pornography can escalate, escalate really quickly with us because of the way that our brain works a little bit different than women. So it could start out where it's, it's just a topless photo or then maybe it's a full yeah. nude. And then by the end of it, it's got to be some crazy orgy going on and it could escalate rather quickly that our, that men and women's brains work a little well, bit different with it. Or it could work the exact opposite way too. You know, where you start with orgies and go down to the almost vanilla stuff um, usually doesn't. But when I talk to groups about this, um, it's, it's easy to explain it as this is the gambler addict who started at $20 a hand, moves to 50. And before you know it, they're spending $100 a hand at blackjack and losing their kid's college fund. This is the alcoholic who starts with beer, moves on to wine, and then moves on to the hard stuff. 
because you become numb to it. Your, you know, dopamine receptors and the serotonin and oxytocin and all that fun stuff that's swimming around up there, you know, you fry your brain. And so what you're looking at doesn't do it for you. These are, when you talk to addicts, the three, four, five, 10 hour marathon pornography sessions because they are just looking for that one piece that tickles them in their in their brain the right way. And while most of them don't want to admit it, yeah, it does escalate and it may end up with, you know, some stuff that is of a sexual nature, maybe, you know, transgendered stuff, maybe homosexual stuff, maybe involving animals, you know, uh, stuff that they would never want to admit that they look at, but it gets to the point they have to look at something uh, that extreme, that so far off the chart to feel anything. And, you know, that's why, that's why we need to talk about porn addiction because that is where it goes. Yeah. Mikey, you had a question there. I think I interrupted you. Yeah. So you did the six months after the cops came to your door. Is that the, not immediately. No, I actually, I was arrested in early 2014. Um, it was a very big public deal. I, mm-hmm. I had to run from TV cameras a couple times that day. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, But I went to see my lawyer the next day. And the first thing he asked me was, is this a litigation game or is this a sentencing game? And I said, it's sentencing. They've got me. I'm never going to try to say they don't because they did. They proved it to me. Mm-hmm. Um, despite the fact that I probably didn't know she was underage, it sure, doesn't sure. matter. I know 16 year olds look 26 and vice versa. Right. Um, I, and I should have known better, but whatever, um, that, that was what happened. And I said, it's, it's, a, it's a sentencing game. And he said, okay, well, do you have any drug or alcohol issues? And I said, no, no, I don't. And my wife was there with me and my father was there with me because he was a friend of my dad's. And my dad and my wife both said, oh yes, he's got a massive alcohol issue. And I was like, oh, you guys know that? He's like, yes, we've known for years you're an alcoholic and it's pretty Mm -hmm. bad and you need to do something about it. We just knew we couldn't get through to you. And so so I said, okay, fine. You know what? Send me off for four weeks to a rehab. I'll get my certificate. It'll look good for the judge. Mm -hmm. And my lawyer looked at me and said, hey, 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 you're going to be in some legal issues for a while here. This may take two years. This may take three years. This may take four years. You may get no jail time. You may get a lot of prison time. You may get no probation. You may get a lot of probation. No matter what, one day, all of this legal stuff will be over. Do you want to be the same asshole that you are now? (laughs) Wow. That was, that was, that was the first little light that went off. And a week later, I went out to Palm Springs um, to a rehab and it wasn't 28 days. It was actually 70. And I, I was probably around day 10 that I got with the program. Mm-hmm. And uh, around probably seven, eight weeks into it, my, my um, caseworker recognized that I had a pornography addiction. He referred me to a guy he knew um, off campus outside of our rehab. And I went to his office a couple times a week for the last several weeks that I was in Palm Springs. And he, I think this was the first time I truly heard the concept porn addiction. And he didn't take long to prove to me that I had a porn addiction, that it grew out of what happened at this babysitter's house, and that the porn addiction actually predated the the alcoholism. So I came, I was there, like I said, for about uh, 10 weeks. I came home, met a fantastic therapist who I'm still seeing to this day. She and I were doing two or three marathon sessions of two hours a day for several months. And then we decided I should go to another inpatient uh, center for sex and pornography addiction because it, it did me so much good with the alcohol. So I went to Texas the summer of 2015 um, for seven weeks. And that was the most transformative experience of my life. It was just wow. amazingly wonderful. It helped me learn so much. It helped me understand so much. And then I came back and continued with the therapy, continued with the uh, research. And what was ironic was when I stood in front of that judge almost two years after I was arrested, I was absolutely the healthiest version of myself that I had ever been in my life to that point. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the judge even said, I know that the version of you that I'm sentencing 
is not the version of you that committed this crime. Right. And, but she's a but. I still have to do this. I still have to show society that you can't do what you did. And even though you get better, get away with it. And I, I said, I understand 100%. And I went and I, I served my time and it, it was not fun. Um, but I, like I said, I was able to write the first draft of my book and I was able to commit to myself that I wanted to, especially after meeting these guys in jail who didn't have the resources sure. or to, to get proper help that um, I wanted to do something out there and start spreading the word and figured with my communication skills, with the fact I, I, I was somewhat known here in Maine, I knew I could get a little bit of traction in building a platform. And here I am now, three years later, lucky enough to be talking to you guys. The Knocking Doors Down Autobiography by Carlos Vieira. It takes you deep into his destructive past and how racing saved his life and opened the door to give back to the community. And 100% of the sales go directly to the Carlos Vieira Foundation, an organization committed to raising awareness for addiction, mental health, and autism. And for inspiration and motivation, tune in weekly to the podcast every Thursday for real-life episodes from celebrities and local heroes. Get Knocking and doors down today at kddmediacompany.com or Amazon. I wanted to know what was going through your head during, okay, you got the sentencing, even though you're a completely different person now, when you're going to jail for that particular reason, those typically have a bigger target on their back. So I was wondering, yeah. what were your thoughts going in? Like, were you afraid for your life? I'm sure a lot of people are when they go into jail, but when it's for that reason, a little bit more so. Yeah, I, I uh, in uh, even the time leading up to sentencing, when I was sentenced, I was given a uh, one week stay so I could get my affairs in order, right, uh, right. which was really just me asking to, you know, prolong it as long as I could. Sure. Um, and uh, I talked to I because of who I was in the in the uh, in in the community, I was able to call the police chief who I knew very well and said, what am I going to face here? Mm -hmm. And ironically, the sheriff of our county at the time, the seat that I took on the city council was the one that he vacated. So I called him up and I said, what am I going to face when I go here? And he said, well, you know, I've already looked into it and you are going to be going into minimum security because I took all of the uh, required tests and everything mm -hmm. to find out if I was at a risk of recidivism. And I scored as low as possible. I scored what you guys would score. I scored as low as possible. Mm -hmm. And so he said, you're going into minimum security and we're going to put you into um, protective custody. And basically that's the guard is outside your door. What you're going to be with, you're going to be with other men who have these kinds of crimes. Most, because this is county jail, not state prison. Mm -hmm. Most of these guys are awaiting trial. Right. Um, so they haven't even been tried yet. They're just waiting. Or you're going to be with men who don't want to deal with the general population. So nobody's going to bother you. Mm -hmm. And it was absolutely true. Nobody did bother me. I think the worst right. I saw were two young guys kind of jockeying for position with each other, looking like they were going to fight, but they didn't. And then what was because of jail overcrowding, our pod was actually the old library. So we had a private shower. So huh. nobody ever came into the shower or in the bathroom when anybody's in there. We had a sign we would flip over. Um, so all of these horror stories that I'd built up in my head, once I got there and realized I wasn't going to get my ass kicked, nobody was going to try anything in the shower or anything like that. You know, mm -hmm. I was able to call home and tell my mother, I am perfectly safe here. This right. is going to stink. This is going to take forever. But I, I'm perfectly fine here. Don't worry about my safety. And once I knew my safety was okay, um, it, it was a lot of anxiety disappeared because oh, sure. for two years, just despite the fact I was getting so much better and I was thriving in recovery, I had this, you know, albatross hanging over my head yeah. of you may go to jail here at some point. Mm -hmm. And things were put off because of one thing or another. And it took two years before I stood in front of a judge. Yeah. Well, what about it when you're when you're in jail as far as with your medication, that main maintenance of it? 
Um, they had to switch the medication up a little because I was on, uh, it wasn't an opiate, what was it? it was a benzo that I was on yeah. at the time, and they wouldn't allow anybody to take benzos in jail. So um, they contacted my doctor, they contacted my wife, and they found a different medication. One of the other, I, I take two meds. One of the other medications was fine. Well, Butrin was absolutely fine for me to take mm -hmm. because uh, whatever... Uh, category it's in was fine and then i also take something for uh, acid reflux and um <laughs> that, that that was fine too and believe me the food in jail gives you a lot of acid reflux I um, so that, that was fine that was fine too but you know twice a day twice a day the the nurse comes with her cart to the door and screams meds and there's a guard standing there and you take your meds and he checks your mouth to make sure you're not you know trying anything crazy mm -hmm. or uh, and uh that's that that was it i mean aside from here's the time you have to eat here's the time you take your meds and here's the time that's lights out as long as you're not causing trouble they don't want anything from you mm -hmm. and that was a very weird adjustment period sure. when nobody wants anything from you i went from being a city councilor from you know running a company from being a father being you know a husband to having no responsibility whatsoever and that is a very very odd feeling and i have some dissociative issues anyway uh, so just no no you know thinking about a clock no worrying about anything. it was it was one day after another it was the movie groundhog day and I'm sure Two or three months. Two or three months into it, my mind stopped uh, measuring time in normal ways. I, I was getting worried about it because it just all melted into each other. It was a very mm -hmm. strange thing. And I look back now, and it's been five years since I was there. I don't remember very much of it. Um, the little pieces I do remember are just snippets. It's like. I intentionally did not, you know, record any of that that happened in my life. Or once I got out, I deleted the tape because six months is a long time. And I think back to it and it just, it doesn't register of, of you know, that, that, that I was doing that for six months um, because my mind just got so sort of numb while I was in there. Yeah, let's. I want to know about the process of of reintegrating into your home life. That's something actually with anyone that we've spoken about that's gone through recovery with a family, because, you know, we we focus obviously on the guests, but people forget that life has moved on for for your your children and your wife. You know, as you're in these different places and the environment, because you come back different, your environment's going to be different, and all of that has to change, and everyone has to kind of rework together what was that process like with well the, 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 thing, the, the thing that got me the thing that got me was especially after the first one where i was gone 10 weeks and you know i left a very cold area to and where i you know was isolating a lot to go to this very warm desert climate where for the first time since middle school i suddenly met 30 new people and it was that was a very weird uh adjustment but I adjusted fast to it. And there was part of me that really didn't like leaving rehab because I knew these people and I had deep, meaningful relationships with these people. And I came back to Maine and, you know, they warned us of it, but it, 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 I didn't really appreciate till I got here is that you are a new person, but everybody else is the same. And they remember the asshole who left and that's what, and that's what they expect. So yeah. there is, there is a very challenging adjustment period where you have some understanding of yourself that you've never had before. You have a whole bunch of new tools to use that you've never had before, but you're, and you've just gone through 10 weeks of not having normal day-to-day -day responsibilities and then you come home and those responsibilities are back. And part of those responsibilities was what drove you to drink or, or look at porn yeah. or do whatever you do in the first place. And there are a lot of people expecting you to fail. And there are a lot of people, uh, especially in my case, because I, I hid my addiction so much and it was out in the media right after it happened that I think they felt betrayed by me. So sure. they were, they, I was shunned by people around me. And it was a very tough adjustment period for me where 
You know, I, I didn't feel safe going out in my community. If I wanted to have dinner with my, my wife and kids, or if I wanted to go to a movie, you know, I drove 40 miles away down to Portland where, you know, I could be anonymous and they didn't know me, you know, nearly as well. Cause every restaurant in my area advertised in my magazine, you know, the two movie theaters advertised in my magazine, everybody knew me. And suddenly I was the guy who, oh my God, did you see what he did? And I, I couldn't handle it at that point. So I would run and I would isolate and I would hide. And except for going to my therapist, I didn't do anything locally. Um, and that took me, it took me a while to get through it. Um, I had a similar, although not as bad adjustment period after the second rehab, um, where again, you come back, you're a new person and everybody's the same old people. Um, but uh, I held on to enough that I didn't relapse. And I can honestly say, knock on wood, knocking doors down, there's your plug. <laughs> Um, that, uh, that I have not relapsed once. And I think that's, that's awesome. because I Good am a you. crazy, stubborn control freak. And what I've, what I learned, the number one thing I learned in rehab is that while I can now stay away from porn, while I can now stay away from alcohol, you know, becoming, you know, clean, getting into recovery does not radically change your personality. Um, yeah. it changes changes parts of it. It changes the parts, especially when you're using, but you're largely still the same person. You just have to learn to use your superpowers for good and not evil. And, and, and that was to me, that's the, that's, that's the whole thing in recovery is learn how to be a good person, not a person who just does whatever they need, not a person who is just trying to survive, but a person who is trying to actually thrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, and, and that's and you you nailed it. I mean, that's what we're about: taking your adverse times, finding a passion with them, and using them as a gift to go out and 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 turn it around, and you know, wipe away guilt, shame, you know, everything else. Because boy, living and that's what gets us driving off to our addiction in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like, I look back at the guy I was, and I don't know how I was functioning. I don't know how I was still alive that last year. Yeah. Um, it, it's, like I said, there, there's embarrassment, there's shame. You know, I, I never like to come on a podcast or a radio show and tell that story, but I tell it because people need to hear it. Because right. people need to understand that it can happen to anybody, including them. And that, you know, it's, it's, it's not the end of the world if it happens and it's not the end of your life if it happens and for 35 36 years i was a taker and i scratched to survive and i did what i had to do to survive and now with the next 35 years i'm going to be a giver not a taker and i'm going to try to put more out into the world than i took and i figure by doing this going on shows like yours you know if we can save a few people uh, if we can create a few less victims, maybe in the end, I save more people and help more people than I hurt. And then I can honestly say on my deathbed that my life was a net good. And, you know, I think that's all anybody can ask for is, is when your time comes, was your life good or was it bad? Were you a giver? Were you a taker? And I am just so, so grateful that I had those two years between arrest and sentencing to totally work on myself full time and to come to the conclusion and come to the realization that I could still turn things around. Um, and if I can turn things around with two addictions, with bipolar, with just massive media coverage here in Maine of what happened to me, I mean, we had to run from TV cameras in my house the day that I was arrested. There was Can't one imagine. point where we, well, you, you want to talk some crazy surreal stuff. Uh, the 10 o'clock news comes and sets up to do a remote right in front of my house on the street. And this was the third time in the day. So we knew the, we knew the drill. We went, we turned off the lights, went from the uh, living room into the bedroom. And then we turned on the TV to see what was happening on TV. And we realized we forgot our dog out in the living room. Oh. And we're, wa we're watching TV and we're seeing our dog 
in the front window bark at the person on TV and we can hear our dog barking and we can, you know, from the other room and we can right. see it on TV and just standing there going, oh my God, there's our house in real time and there's our dog in real time. And holy shit, can you believe what is happening here? This is, you wouldn't believe this if it was in a movie Sounds and like a it's happening in time. real time. You know, it's, it's, so, you know, it's, it's, it's all a process. My process was much more public than a lot of people's. Sure. A lot of people get to hide this, but I, I just decided that if I was going to be so out there, um, once I got my stuff together that uh, I would try to make things better. And, and that's what I do. And, you know, Oh, I, I, I would say before COVID, I was out talking to people. Now it's all online, but I still talk to college people, classes. I still talk to other groups. Like you, you know, you mentioned earlier, I had the TED talk. Um, anybody who will listen, I will talk to them about this, whether there's two people or 22,000 people, um, more people need to recognize porn addiction as an issue and hopefully seek out more information and, and get a base of knowledge. I think everybody knows about alcoholism. Everybody knows a little bit about, um, you know, drug addiction. It's time that everybody knows a little bit about porn addiction so we can make smarter decisions and we can guide the next generation and our children to make better decisions than, uh, than our generations did because we just didn't know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Mikey, uh, how about uh, we do some random questions with Josh? Let's get into it. I'll go first. All right. All right. Josh, if they were to make a movie about you, who would you cast to play you? Uh, <clears throat> that's a good question. Now, are we just doing the movie right now in my life, like adult me, who I am right now? From beginning to now, from well, when this started to now. Hey, this is my he, question. Well, I mean, if he's saying <laughs> all of his life, he's got to, he, he can't have the same person play him as a child. Right. Because we only from, have a six month production window. So we have to have multiple <laughs> actors playing me. Um, from when, okay, we'll say. I'd get the kid from Sixth Sense because he seemed to really uh, go downhill, and that kind of sure. traces me. So maybe uh, Haley Joel Osment That's what can almost yeah. do this as a he can be. We can mix his story and my story, so it's semi autograph autobiographical both ways. Because mm -hmm. I remember he he was busted for weed at one point, and he gained a bunch of weight, and you know his life didn't go the way that everybody thought it would, and sure. he was somebody else on the inside. Right. So I, I think he might, he might be a good choice. Ellie yeah. Joel Osmond. Okay. What's uh, something uh, surprising that people would, uh, would uh, like to know about you? Maybe that you don't talk about much, be it career or hobbies or. Uh, that I am a massive, massive pro wrestling fan. Uh, yes. That I, yeah, that uh, I think it is the greatest form of participatory theater this side of Rocky Horror Picture Show. Um, that um, I think it's ridiculous that there are people out there that don't recognize. We get it. It's staged. Yeah. You don't have to. You don't have to be the. You don't have you to be the beacon of stuff. light. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to be the beacon of light anymore. Um, and to anybody out there who has to deal with this, just say, I missed the part where they said it was real. Can you rewind to that? Because I never <laughs> heard them actually claim it was real. Or if you want to do that, and I, I did this when I was in jail and I got some really nasty looks because there were half the people in jail wanted to watch Monday Night Raw every week and half the people hated it and were like, this is right. stupid shit and this is fake. Um, <laughs> I remember, I think it was TBS or TNT was doing their root series, their, their remake. And in that one scene where Kunta Kinte is getting whipped and refuses to call himself Toby, these guys were really deeply into it. And I walked over to them and said, you know, he's just an actor. He's not really getting whipped. You understand that, right? <laughs> this is, this is, there's just a camera there. It's okay. They're catering this. He's not really getting whipped. He's an actor. It's okay. And they looked at me like they wanted to take me into the shower room and beat the crap out of me. <laughs> but, but I felt like it was turnaround as fair play. You know, we were all in on the joke. It's great fun to watch. Sometimes it's better than others. When it's good, it's great. When it's bad, it's horrible. Um, but I, I, I love the storytelling aspects of professional wrestling. And I think it was those storytelling aspects of professional wrestling growing up that pushed me to want to be a writer. 
Yeah, I know I can relate so much. It was such a huge impactful thing on me at, at an early age. And my favorite argument was always when people do that, you know, it's fake, right? I'm like, wait, what was, tell me, was Arnold Schwarzenegger really a robot? And they're yeah. like, oh, fuck you. <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. fake. Well, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> These are all very mentally ill people. If this isn't fake, who wears a cape like that and puts pa face paint on and, you know, screams like the Ultimate Warrior did? Normal people don't do that. It's obviously a show. Yeah. Wait, so Kane and Undertaker aren't related? Oh, don't shit, go I... there. My <laughs> life is shattered. <laughs> my, life, my life is ruined. Uh, you're up, Mikey. All right. If you could have dinner with just one person, living or not, who would it be and why? I would have, while I am not religious, I would have uh, dinner with Jesus. Not our first time, huh? I would want to know if, if, if everything went the way he expected. I would have a very historical uh, Q&A with him uh, about what happened before he died and what happened and what has happened after. And I would want to know what happened to the body because uh, it disappeared. And... The idea is he ascended into heaven and the body disappeared. How come none of us disappear? So, mm. and we supposedly go to heaven. So I want to know what happened to his body. And I think he would know. That's pretty damn interesting. That's a great answer. Um, all right. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Uh, geez, when I was in my addiction, it would have been x-ray vision. Um, but uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, you know, that's a great question. I would be able to pull money out of my ass. <laughs> that's, I, I, that I, is a first. That is a truly original, it clearly a writer and creative brain answer. Didn't want to go with like the ear. I, I, I don't need to fly. I don't need to run <laughs> anywhere real fast. I need cash. And, uh, and that, that would be my superpowers. My ass would be an ATM. Oh shit! Hey, can't argue that. <laughs> what uh? What are some of your pet peeves? People who are late because it's just as easy to be on time as it is to be late. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, people who wear perfume and cologne that the rest of us have to smell um, because I, I I just don't like strong Unless odors it's like that. <laughs> manscaped.com <laughs> well and, use and, promo code kdd for 20 percent off 20 percent off that's the cool well, and i'm talking about that bad smelling stuff not that oh, I, oh that's not man uh, um and uh <laughs> i yeah pet peeves um you know i don't sweat a lot of the small stuff anymore i would have been able to answer this a lot better 10 years ago and we could have done a two-hour show um <laughs> uh, but it's largely um People who act like experts in an area that I am an expert on because I don't do that to them. Um, I can see that would be and annoying, yeah. That, that drives me absolutely crazy. That always has. Um, otherwise than that, you know, it's, I, I, I learned how to get rid of resentments. I don't hold stuff against people. I don't hold grudges. Uh, a lot of stuff just comes off my back and... and in a way it never did before. And, and I recognize I can't control so much in this world, you know, so I don't have a ton of pet peeves. Uh, well, good that's deal. good. That's probably less stressful. Cause yeah. I got a shit ton. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> no, my, my life is so much more stressful than it ever has. Like, you know, all this, all this stuff with the presidency and everything happening now, you know, 10 years ago, I would have been on Facebook being like, here's what I think. And you should listen to me. Right. And right. I never changed a single opinion and nobody ever changed my opinion. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, that was yeah. just narcissism and hubris. And you know what? I don't even watch the news anymore uh, for nope. the most part. Um, unless something massive's happening, because I just, I, I have no influence on any of this stuff, and I, I stayed in my sphere now. Yeah, yeah I no, can absolutely. relate to that. All right, one last one. <clears throat> Favorite curse word. Do you have one? Uh, ever since I saw train spotting, I really like saying for fuck's sake. <laughs> and I actually, I actually have a problem not saying it in like a Scottish Irish accent because oh, so many of those it. 
so for the fuck's sake um, right. so so many of those movies that come out of there especially the movies that came out of the mid 90s they're saying for fuck's sake all the time i think that was like the the yeah. international swear of western europe of the mid 90s so I, I i tend to say for fuck's sake all the time and i have to be for careful that for fuck's sake and, uh, <laughs> for fuck's sake, eh? and, and, and I, I don't know why it comes out like that it's almost as bad as um when and this is a this this is not racist and this is me admitting it's an issue is when i go on podcasts that are from india i have the hardest time in the world in the first five minutes not doing an indian accent oh like it's a guilty. mirroring thing or i don't know what it is but i i i it's it's an nlp thing and i i've learned a bit about that and it's I, I'm the least racist person in the world compared to most people, but I have to fight myself to a lot of times not mirror what I'm hearing. I can relate to that as a kid that was kind of uh, grew up watching way too much Saturday Night Live, especially Dana Carvey. I, yeah. I have that problem. So you are not alone in the world with that. At all. Good. I do that Good. during Good. arguments. Like if someone's arguing with me and they have like, a high pitched voice or some sort of accent, whatever ethnicity that might be. I do that. <laughs> I just yeah. can't help it. Okay, so so we're all bad people. That's <laughs> that makes Whoa, me feel so well, much better. Welcome to the club. You know, yeah. we're all in yeah. shitsville together. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Joshua, we like to let, let you have the last word and, and let people know how they can find out more about you. Yeah, um, like you guys mentioned, I've written three books. I do uh, coaching um, through Zoom, through Skype, uh, with porn addicts, with people who are suffering betrayal trauma. Um, I also, if, if that is a little bit too invasive for you, I do have an online course just for uh, betrayal uh, trauma sufferers. So you can take that in a very passive way. That's available on my website. Um, I also write a couple articles every week there, both about addiction and about recovery. There's a page of resources in case you have any issues and want to look deeper into it. Just And if you want to just get in touch with me, check out recoveringpornaddict.com. Um, that's recoveringpornaddict.com. It links to everything I have ever done or will ever do. Um, and then I'm also, you know, social media, P Addict Recovery, Instagram, and uh, Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. And then uh, I'm not on Facebook because, again, I don't care how you voted. <laughs> I hear you, brother. <laughs> and of course, for those listening, all those links are in the description of the uh, podcast. Uh, Joshua, thanks, man. We really appreciate this. Thank you for the eye-opening knowledge and conversation and the fun and laughter, too. Yeah, I had a good time. And that's the thing, you know, that I always try to tell people is it is a very serious subject, but we can talk about it in a matter of fact way. And that's how we're going to get through to it. And that's how we're going to do this. And, you know, for any parents out there, the anti porn speech is not the birds and the bees speech. It's similar to the don't smoke speech. It's similar to the don't drink speech. And you know what, we need to make this happenstance. We need to make this matter of fact. And I think that you, the three of us just showed, we don't have to get graphic. We don't have to get dirty. We can talk about this like adults. We can joke and laugh. And that's where we need to move as a society when it comes to pornography. So thank you so much for giving me this platform and letting me uh, speak to your listeners. I appreciate it so very much. Yeah, thanks for your time. Absolutely. Man. I can, I can I'm a, 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 I'm a